You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present Tears of the Devil by John Fryer with Nigel Peaver, Richard Graylin, Jeff Bainham and Robin Ingram as the banker. The play is set in a fictional White House in the early years of the 21st century. Episode 2 Money is naturally the biggest lie of them all. But what is money? Money is nothing. It does not exist. No more than the metal that jangles in your pocket. But... If lent to another person, a company, or even a country, to be returned at a rate of interest, then that non-existent currency takes on a value all of its own. It is that simple, basic law of economics that has allowed us to run the world since the time of the Romans. It is that rule that shall enable us to stay in power long after every democratically elected leader has left office written his memoirs, and returned to the earth. We're expecting resistance to be light, sir. How can you know that? There have already been discussions with certain factions within the Syrian military. That was fast. Yes and no, sir. Some of the Syrian high command consider President Bashar to be too much of a liberal, while others think of him still in the shadow of his father, I guess he can't win either way. So he's surrounded by enemies. That's what you're saying? Whatever he does, someone won't be pleased. We just need to push the right buttons with certain generals at the right times and wait for the defections to occur. That's how it was done with Saddam's army, Mr. President. You mean you bribed them not to fight? That's correct, sir. And it worked then. And it will work then. <laughs> Syria was today handed a list of 20 demands from the United Nations over the sinking of the British oil tanker Ocean Spirit. In the form of UN Resolution 1589, which specifically demands the handing over of the suspects to the International Criminal Court. These allegations were presented this afternoon before a session in which the Syrian ambassador fervently denied that his country had any involvement whatsoever with the terrorist group the Ansoir, or connection to the attack on the oil tanker. We completely refute any accusation of responsibility for this barbarous act. Syria is completely innocent of all the charges that have been leveled at her. We are also doing all we can to locate this American citizen, Joe Griffiths currently being held by this group, the Ansoir, but Syria cannot affect the release of someone we do not have, and over a group over which we have no control or influence. Following these denials, the Security Council has gone into an emergency meeting to discuss the crisis. However, it is privately being mentioned in the corridors of power that if Syria does not or will not hand over the individuals responsible for the attack, then military action may be considered as a future option. The media is readying the country for war. The idea that we might find a peaceful solution is not even being suggested as a possibility. I think the assumption, sir, is that as the British are determined to go after this terrorist group in Syria, and as we are their best friends, we're going to be dragged into this, whether we like it or not. I've already spoken to the Prime Minister, and yes, I've agreed we'll be there. What else could I say? What else can we do? Not much, I'm afraid, Mr. President. Inside sources have already revealed last night secret talks about the state of the American and possibly several European economies. After the Federal Reserve admitted the 2% negative growth in the last three quarters, shares have slowly but steadily declined in value. The job market is no longer looking quite as healthy as it once did, and its citizens are starting to tighten their belts. Due to our contacts within the Syrian military, we are confident that the majority will either take no part in a resistance campaign 
or return to their barracks taking their orders from our friendly commanding officers. But what about those inside the capital itself? Not everyone over there will welcome us. There's always someone prepared to have a pop at our guys. Central Command is estimating small arms fire and RPGs from certain members of the Syrian population. And the worst thing for presidents and prime ministers on both sides of the Atlantic is that there doesn't appear to be any immediate light at the end of this financial tunnel. Carl, just a minute. Yes, sir. No, you used to work on Wall Street. What do you know of put options? A put option, Mr. President, is a bet that the price of certain stock on the financial markets will fall. Go on. Well, you can buy a put option for as little as one dollar. One option is worth 100 shares. You don't actually even have to own the stock itself. If you buy the stock at a fixed price, you can then sell the shares back in, say, 16 weeks. And if the price is dropped, it's the purchaser who carries the loss. You pocket the difference. Explain it to me like I'm not a stockbroker. Okay. If you buy 100 shares at $1 each and then the share price falls through the floor, you can exercise your option at $100. Pay the initial $1 and take back 99 in profit. In effect, it works in reverse of the normal ways of trading. That's correct, sir. You make your money, providing the price per share loses its value. The trick, I assume, is to know which companies are about to receive some very bad news. That's the trick, Mr. President. A yeah, sort of reverse version of insider information. What's on your mind? I want you to do something for me. Yes, sir. The Jupiter Shipping Company were the owners of the Ocean Spirit, insured by banks in London. Find out for me if anyone anywhere in the world placed put options on Jupiter stock and any other companies and subsidiaries that are part of it, as well as the shipping industry in general. I want to know who knew in advance. Okay. Thank you. There was something else you might like to know. Good or bad? Depends on how you choose to view it, sir. Mm, what have you found? Something in the Wall Street Times. A small piece, easy to miss, several pages back, not on the front page. Just a few lines about stock prices. Yes? The oil companies are starting to buy back their own shares. In bulk. Now that is interesting to know. So tell me, what are they preparing for? What do the major energy producers know that we don't? Hello? General Mahmoud. As you know, news travels fast, especially bad news here in Washington. It's receiving some coverage, and it's falling neatly into our hands. Your contact's timing has worked out even better than we had anticipated. Yes, that poor guy looked suitably ashen-faced on the TV screen. As the time nears, the news people will fall over themselves to deliver all the awful news first. Remember, with these people, it's about being the first with the story, not whether or not the story is accurate. And it'll just be another nail in the Syrian coffin. The Syrian authorities say they are doing everything in their power to locate our reporter, but we both know the chances of them finding him in time are remote. But what can we do? So I wanted to take this opportunity to say how much we appreciate all your efforts in this matter. And is there anything else you require of us? So to conclude, Mr. President, with our new bases firmly secured in Iraq, as well as support carriers in the Gulf and the Met, we will be in a position to strike as soon as the diplomatic process is seen to have failed at the UN. And we're sure that the diplomatic process will fail? Of course, Mr. President. We all hope for success with applying pressure to the Syrian government, but it's only rational to prepare for all eventualities. Let's make sure that diplomacy works, Carl. Some people already think we've stamped our feet on too much of the Arab world. It is. Anything else? Good. Then that's it. Thank you, Carl. Mr. President. What do you make of that? Your Secretary of State was right. We should be prepared for whatever may happen. Sounds like he's already prepared for war. It may come to that. The Syrians continue to refuse to hand over these terrorist suspects. President Bashar is surrounded by hardliners from his farthest time. 
he is going to find it almost impossible to hand over the people behind the sinking of the ocean spirit. He would simply lose too much face in front of the Arab world and those around him. Then he will not be able to hand anyone over to us. Is that the position? Is that why you think we'll go to war? Oh, Mr. President, no one wants war. Oh, how wrong you are, David. The arms manufacturers are salivating at the mere idea of all those lucrative contracts. There are a few things this country likes more than a war thousands of miles far from home. Heed my words, David. The stock market is already starting to feel healthy and vibrant. Accountants are already calculating projected earnings from next year's weapon sales to put in this year's returns and balance sheets. Many people, David, seek profit over peace and look to the White House as no more than the green light to receiving all those government checks. Not everyone hopes for peace, David, as we do. There is just too much money in war. Mr. President, London is hopping mad over this attack. They expect us to stand by them. We've already been through this, sir. The Syrian ambassador is waiting in the mural room. Find out what he wants to hand over these suspects. I say suspects. Do we even have names for them? We do, sir. And we won't find out later that half these suspects are still alive and living it up in Saudi, will we? We certainly won't, Mr. President. But how did we acquire that information? It came from the CIA, Mr. President. The history of the White House is littered with crazy plans and operations dreamt up in Langley that this office then has to defend before the world community. Talk to the ambassador. Offer him something, anything. But don't let this nation get dragged into another Middle Eastern conflict. We'd leave the British to fight alone. I said I'd work something out with London. Just stop us from killing more innocents. I don't want to be just one more U.S. president who is only remembered for yet another war in a faraway place. I'll see what can be done, Mr. President. Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Sterling. Are you well? Why are you turning on us, David? What gives you the right to force your will on the Arab state? Have we not allowed you to buy our oil for years? For which we have paid you handsomely over the decades. But now we want more than just your energy reserve. Syria is currently going through a time of dramatic change. If you continue to apply your pressure to President Bashar, as you have done, there are forces within my government that he will no longer be able to contain. Those hardliners are our interest, or at least a beginning. Perhaps you could explain. Ahmed, we know that every time your young president tries to modernize the situation in Damascus, he is stopped by the likes of General Zuhair, Foreign Minister Hafiz, Finance Minister Assad and Minister of the Interior Faisal, men who were in your government when his father held the reins of power. He could not remove them, and neither can the son. We both also know it was these same men that had influence with Hezbollah during the 80s when they held hostages in Lebanon. We couldn't move against these men then, and your president can't be seen to get rid of them now. This feels like a betrayal to us. Betrayal's an emotive word, Mr. Ambassador. After all our help with the CIA over Al-Qaeda, now you treat us like this? You stab us in the back. After all our help to you, you stab us in the back. Given the choice of Iraq or the U.S. in 2003, your president Bashar chose Iraq, so don't pretend... It's all been some loving relationship between our two countries, Mr. Ambassador. Al-Qaeda cells were infiltrated by Syrian intelligence, and that information provided to your security services. 